The Unshackled Waves, episode 185. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. As you all know, I've been promoting the Australian tour of internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness, since it was announced in late August. He has joined an impressive lineup of right of centre personalities who've been touring Australia this year. In the lead up to his tour this November, we've been lucky enough to be granted an interview with Gavin himself from his CRTV studio for today's show. Gavin, welcome to The Unshackled. Thanks for having me, Broham. Oh, that's good to hear. Now, in your uh, biography, it's always noted you were a co-founder of uh, Vice Media back uh, when it started in 1994. Now, many on the... Wait, wait. I don't like the term co-founder. I think it trivializes my input. I I like the term creator. Creator. Oh, I created Vice. Yep, whatever you're happy with. Now, uh, these <laughs> days, many on the right hold vice responsible for the progressive uh, brainwashing of millennials. Do you, do you ever sit back and wonder and think, my God, what did I create? Yes, I certainly do. And I don't just think that with vice. I think that about my entire life. I mean, I was a punk rocker before vice. And I think our generation, the 80s punks, it, I was an anarcho punk. I was basically Antifa, and we policed words and we talked about language and we had trannies at the anarchist gatherings and we said traditionalism is a joke and you shouldn't have kids and and we need you know e- equal results for everyone no matter what they do <laughs> and uh, we were radical lefties and I'm worried I made a mess. Uh, maybe I'm trying to clean it up now by encouraging people to have kids and not get divorced and venerate the housewife and venerate the entrepreneur. Maybe I'm serving penance for my earlier rebellion. Yes, since leaving Vice, you've become known as a a right wing or as the mainstream media like to say, far right uh, commentator. Yeah, that's the that's the buzzword. But how do you uh, describe your political evolution and philosophy? You know, I wasn't really that political my whole life. I've always been more into comedy and art and fashion and music and stuff, which was why that's what Vice centered on, because I was the main contributor. But um, 9-11 was a slap in the face to me and all New Yorkers. That really, that politicized Anthony Cumia and Pamela Geller and a lot of people who weren't really involved. I think a lot of New Yorkers went, wait, what's going on? What have you guys been doing? And so that made me uh, more politically interested. But you have to understand, with the media class today and entertainment in general, if you don't support all of the leftist tropes, you're blackballed from comedy, you're blackballed from uh, advertising, you're blackballed from any kind of like talk show appearances. So you end up sort of sequestered to a political talk show. Like, I, I couldn't do a sitcom. I couldn't do any movies. I was just I was just in a movie recently when all this was happening, and uh, there's a scene in it where there's a, a dance club scene, and the person is having a bad trip on a, on acid or something, and the musician found out I was in the film and removed his music from the film, so they had to use some sort of copyright free crap at the last second, just because I happened to be later on in the feature. So you say, how did you end up here? I'm kind of on a gulag. <laughs> I've been banished from everything else I was doing, which is fine. I mean, I'm making way more money than I have in since I don't even know when. Yeah, so you've been in the the traditional media, broadcast television and uh, print uh, journalism, uh, but obviously your biggest impact has been your, your internet uh, TV shows uh, with Compound Media, then Rebel Media, and now you're with uh, CRTV. Uh, now, obviously, the, the new media has changed everything. It's allowed information to get out like it was never able to before, and uh, th- that's one of the reasons why you've broken through and why we don't need to have these leftist ideas to succeed anymore. What do you see as the, the most a pleasing uh, development of the the digital transformation of the media. Oh, the gatekeepers have lost the keys. So they try to shut us down. They ban us from Twitter. They ban us from Facebook and YouTube. But there's always new avenues. And Paul Joseph Watson will always be there to red pill 
an entire generation. And I think that, uh, you know, young people, something like 25 percent identify as conservative, which is the highest it's been since the 80s. This is in America, but I'm sure it's similar in Australia. And that comes from these YouTube videos, from these essays, from people being brave. And I, I think it's a it's an amazing time because CNN, academia, mainstream news, a lot of these pundits, they've drifted away from Earth like a satellite. That's why they were laughing when they heard Trump was going to run for office, because they thought, <laughs> everyone thinks like me, and I think Trump is a jerk. Ergo, he will lose. And then he won, and they went, oh, my God, I don't know anything about the country. We just had the mainstream news here in America. Jeffrey Tubin, I think he's on NBC or CNN, I can't remember. But he said, Antifa is largely known as an African-American <laughs> organization, and Trump hating them is more evidence that he's racist. And you go, have you ever seen Antifa before in your life? What has? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're all professors' kids, those clowns. But um, that I'm sort of seen as a revolutionary, and so is Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux, Jordan B. Peterson, Dave Rubin. We're not revolutionary. We have normal things to say. Hey, I understand that you think that feminism is the be-all and end-all, but you might want to try having kids. You might want to stay at home. I don't think you're really enjoying your job that much. I think you'd be happier at home. Hey, Islam doesn't seem so tolerant, especially to gays and people like you, not you, but the person, the invisible person I'm talking to, the, the, the creative class, the, you'll be the first to go. So all of these tropes, they roll out. Hey, the world's not really that homophobic. Hey, cops aren't hunting black people. Just to say normal things like that, that a normal dad would say in a pub, is the craziest thing ever. And that's more of a comment on them and the environment we're in than it is on me. Here's an analogy, sort of drone on, but, you know, during the Salem witch trials, they thought everyone was a witch, right? And they would burn witches at the stake. So say I was wearing a black T-shirt back then, before t-shirts were invented. And you'd go, oh, wow, you're crazy. You know, you're gonna be burned at the stake. They're gonna think you're a witch. And you go, am I really that crazy though? I'm just wearing a shirt. It's more a comment on the witch hunts than it is on the guy wearing the black shirt. Now, obviously you talked about the, the rise of conservatism among the young and the, the social media uh, companies, they, they, they don't like that that much because they've thrown up barriers uh, recently with the, there seems to be this uh, def mass deplatforming that's happening to some of the, the major players. First it was Alex Jones and Infowars and then uh, you found yourself banned from Twitter. So how do you see this uh, playing out? Because it's only just happened in the, in the past few weeks and we don't know where it's going. Well, they're, they're on a war path right now, and they want to destroy the rights influence in social media because they're scared it's going to get Trump reelected. And isn't it funny? They sort of drove us to this. Like, they took over comedy. You can't be right-wing and work anywhere at Comedy Central. They took over mainstream news. Fox News is the only one that can, that can uh, go against the liberal narrative. And so we get sequestered to YouTube and all these other things, and then we just dominate. Like, talk radio. That was the only place you could be right wing. Talk radio exploded. Next thing you know, 30 million people are listening to Rush, listening to Rush Limbaugh. Hundreds of millions of people have heard Alex Jones on Joe Rogan. Mainstream news would kill to get those kind of numbers. If they get one million, they poop their pants. So they just keep trying to banish us more, and we keep getting more and more powerful. And I promise you, Trump will get, get reelected. And this surge of the new right will continue to grow because it's logical and normal and supports freedom. It's not anti-Semitic, it's not sexist, it's not homophobic, it's not racist. Those are all lies and people are starting to see that. Who could disagree with socially liberal people like myself who want smaller government? Why would you entrust your own freedoms to some stranger? Like the guy when you renew your driver's license behind the plexiglass. Why do you wanna talk, why do you wanna give that guy your rights and I think Australians deep down are, are very libertarian people. So that's why Milo and Lauren and I sell out shows. Oh, well, it's what, what the issue is in Australia is we just, the, the left is even more powerful than they, uh, uh, than they would appear to be in uh, North, North America. And so that's why there's this massive uh, silent pushback. But it's a shrill minority. It's the tyranny of the minority. That you're that you're experiencing over there the, the people screaming racist dog they are definitely the loudest but if you you know get out get out of your car walk through 
walk off the highway, go ring the doorbell of the first house you see. Those people in that house will be reasonable. They'll be normal. They'll share your politics. So we're the majority as normal dads, and we're the ones, you know, determining elections. But Jesus, the the, the screaming hysterical minority, these 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 spoiled brats with bullhorns, they are loud and they are effective. I mean, I, I, I I'll be kind of shocked if this tour goes off without a hitch, and I don't get any bills from the police, and I fly home unscathed. I mean, that will be. That will be a very successful tour, not to get her physically attacked. D despite the fact that there's been these uh, police uh, bills and all these uh, protests, uh, everyone is still wanting to, to come to Australia. Obviously, you're aware what uh, happened to Sorry, your... Sorry, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'll start, I'll st I'll start my question. No, no don't edit that out. That was a beautiful fart. <laughs> That's one of the best farts I've ever had. Now, obviously, you uh, know a bit about uh, Australia, and you uh, famously did a takedown of one of our most uh, famous regressives, uh, Waleed Ali, or Micro Penis, as you uh, called him when uh, he said that uh, Trump advocated uh, sexual assault. Uh, you referred to us as Hot Canada, which is is pretty accurate, and uh, yeah. obviously you've seen how uh, your fellow Canadian alt media colleagues, Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux, were treated while they were here, particularly in uh, my hometown of Melbourne, which is basically the, the leftist uh, festering uh, point of everything. What sort of reception are you expecting? And do you have a strategy for dealing with uh, our media and politicians? Because it's not just our media. We're, we're not lucky enough to have a, a Trump leader in Australia. Obviously, we've, we've changed uh, prime ministers recently, but not much has changed with the uh, leadership from the political class. There'll probably be a new prime minister by the time I show up there in November. You guys get a, you got a hell of a revolving door of prime ministers. Um, by the way, just before I answer your question, is there anything more irritating than Wally Hadid's wife? What, when I yes. see a white woman who grew up normal, with a hijab or a burqa on, I just think, how do you go back in time? How do you reverse progress? It's really impressive. Oh, like she... I understand if you grew up as, you know, a very traditional backwards culture, okay, you, you, that's, that's where you were born. But to experience freedom and then go, no, I need to oppress myself. It's just virtue signaling gone awry. She wrote a book a on Islamic feminism. So that gives you a bit of an idea on who she is. Islamic feminism, that just makes my skin crawl. It's just it's just such a cuck oxymoron, isn't it? But anyway, how is it going to go there? There's going to be riots. There's going to be people screaming their heads off, unfortunately. And this always happens. I, I did a talk at NYU and I was pepper sprayed and they were saying, whose campus are our campus? Whose campus are our campus? Banging and screaming and drowning me out. And the, the way the stage was set up, there was actually m plenty of microphones. I don't know why. But I grabbed one of them and I said, check, check, check. Oh, look, there's tons of microphones here. Come on up. What do you have to say? And they wouldn't come up. So I went down over to the protesters with the microphone. I had my own. And I said, hello, hello, this works. Here, tell me what you have to say. And as I was pushing it towards them, they cringed like it was some sort of radioactive phallus I was sticking in their face. I went, ah. And the Who's Campus chant went, Who's Campus are Campus? And then as I pulled it away, it became loud again. Who's Campus are Campus? And they started screaming as they were, you know, freed from this microphone. They don't want to talk. They don't want truth. This is all just fashion to them. It's the mods and the rockers in the 60s fighting on Brighton Beach. This is all just sports. It's just a silly game to them. And I, for one, don't see speaking the truth as a game. I see it as a crucial part of Western civilization. And you'll probably, uh, the reason that here in Melbourne it, it's so bad is because of our, our dear leader, uh, Daniel Andrews. You'll probably learn uh, a lot more about him. Uh, he's the one who's well, directing uh, the, the police to issue these bills and enabling uh, the, the organization you'll, you'll learn is the, the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism and then the appropriately titled Yelling at Racist Dogs. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that, the Loud Boys. There are no racists. It's a myth. There are more albino skateboarders in the Western world. There's more 
elevator elevators are more dangerous than Nazis. Like even Charlottesville, which was the worst it got, right? And that was a hundred percent of them assembled in one spot. There was what three hundred. That's a fraction of a percent of the American population. They, this is not a thing. Islam's a thing. <laughs> I got plenty of examples of Islamic terrorism and sexism and homophobia. But to focus on this mythical Nazi, I call them Bigfoot chasers. I mean, have you ever heard in your entire life someone sitting down at a bar, someone you don't know, and just using using racial epithets, just going, my God, we got these damn bad word <laughs> hanging around my town. I want them all out of here. I'd like to string them up right now. Kill them all. You'd go, what the hell? I've never met one of you before. They're not around. Now, you're also known as the, the founder and the spiritual leader of the, the Proud Boys, which is a Western fraternal men's organization dedicated to reinstating the, the spirit of Western chauvinism. Now, uh, it started in North America, but expanded throughout the, the Western world. And we have multiple uh, Australian chapters here where they're all excited about your, your tour. Now, at, uh, the, the meetups, they involve a lot of uh, drinking and brotherhood. Uh, but uh, what do you see as the, the overall goals of the the, the Proud Boys in Western society. Well, this goes back to what I was saying about the black t-shirt during the Salem witch trials. It's just a bunch of guys wanted to hang out. That was the norm up until 1980. There was the Elks Lodge, the Shriners, the, the Knights of Columbus. I'm wearing a Knights of Columbus shirt, actually. This was just normal. I was actually inspired by the Knights of Columbus. But this was just normal behavior for men to want to have a men's club where they can fart and not have to pull out a chair and not be polite and tell raunchy jokes. That's what we do. We don't sit there planning terrorist attacks like Antifa does, by the way. Um, we just hang out with each other and riff and play stupid games and have ridiculous rituals. And yes, if there's a talk where Lauren Southern's going and people are threatening to kill her, which they regularly do, and they did in Australia, we will surround her and make sure she gets there uh, and back home safe. That's not a violent group. That's just a bunch of guys that want someone to have the right to speak. And that, by the way, is a billionth of a percent of what we do. 90% of what we do is Budweiser. <laughs> and we also, while we're, you know, hanging around with a bunch of dudes, we say, you should put a ring on it, dude. You've been dating her for how long? Grow some balls. Make some babies. And everyone talks about the few kerfuffles at an Antifa rally. No one talks about all the charity we do, all the men who have proposed, all the men who finally got their wives pregnant because they stopped watching porn, all the guys who got off their ass and started dating again because they were so scared of feminism and Me Too and stigma that they just given up on chicks entirely. So much good has come from this men's club, this seemingly benign men's club, yet they just focus, they just go through it with a fine tooth comb, trying to find one guy out of the, the tens of thousands of us, trying to find one guy who said something rude. And it, it makes me wonder, why, do you, why are you so concerned about someone else's club? Why do you hate the idea of men hanging out so much? It's bizarre, isn't it? Oh, when when men get together, they, this is what the the Australian feminists uh, think is when they get together, they're uh, secretly planning all the ways to oppress women and just uh, fantasize about sexual assault all the time. Yeah, our feminists are particularly well, they're, they're, they're the worst in the world, I think. Do you want to know the secret? Here's a secret. You want to know what men do when they're alone in a room and no one's around and they could be plotting to kill the world? They go, let me ask you some. Would you rather fight a squid or a shark? Now I know, stop, I know you're gonna say you just punched a shark. That's easy to say hypothetically. Let me see you underwater trying to punch something. Now a squid, I feel like you could maybe bite some of the tentacles or something, but then they got that beak, and that beak, that could rip your heart out. That conversation will go on for 20 minutes. Now, obviously, you said that uh, uh, violence is only a small part of uh, or what the, the Proud Boys are known for, but you have said that men do need to experience violence and that uh, violence uh, can solve things. So what exactly do you mean by that? This was all normal stuff when I was a kid. My dad would say, look, pal, don't start fights. But if a fight starts, you finish it. At my boxing gym, there's a big banner. It says, fighting solves everything. You don't pick fights, but you should defend yourself. And there's this strange sort of MLK, Jesus Christ mentality that the left tells us we have to experience where they say, just take it and you can be a martyr and you'll, you can show how violent Antifa is. What do you mean? When they stab me? 
Uh, no. How about you do that? You can go get stabbed by Antifa. I'm going to fight back. I remember at the, uh, we went to this thing called the Deplora Ball after Trump was elected, and it was in Washington, D.C., where these conservative women can't find a date because it's so left-wing there. And so they get to go to a ball. And so I was really, I was kind of angry that it was such a big deal for them. But they finally get one night to go and dance and listen to music and enjoy some fine wines. And they're all dressed to the hilt. And these Antifa guys show up to beat us up. So I just punched, he's, one of them goes, you want to go? And I go, yeah. And I punched him in the face because he was, a, we were getting mobbed. They're throwing feces at us, batteries, all kinds of stuff. There was maybe a mob of 500 people attacking the 80 uh, people attending this thing. And Ann Coulter emailed me after and she said it was so nice to see that finally conservatives punching back because for so long we've just been taking it and they've been getting exponentially more violent. If you look up uh, Portland Antifa weapons confiscation, it looks like something out of medieval England. You wouldn't believe the literal mace, like a mace with the ball and the spikes. Mace, all kinds of weird uh, uh, knives that go in between your fists and, and M80s and, and asps, the collapsible batons. Meanwhile, we get disarmed at every rally we go to by the police. So I'm not violent. I'm not looking for a fight. But when you get attacked and you fight back, it feels pretty good. Violence is wrong. Justified violence feels great. And that is, is not a controversial thing to say. Yeah, and our uh, ABC over here, which is like your CBC in Canada, they actually did an episode on Antifa where they actually went to what well, basically was an Antifa terrorist training camp. Well, they just got, we just had a guy arrested here who had a whole arsenal of, of weapons and guns and bombs. Yet they won't shut up about these mythical Nazis that are about to take down America and start World War III. It's upside down land. It's opposite town. And I don't understand why you're considered violent if you don't want people to stab you. I mean, these guys pepper sprayed me. We, we get attacked everywhere we go. You know, Lauren Southern was at a rally once, and uh, she, I met her there, and she had on goggles and a helmet and a gas mask, and she goes, I feel ridiculous. I feel like I'm dressed up for Halloween. That same day, she had rocks thrown at her, they were throwing tear gas, and she got pepper sprayed. So all of these seemingly silly things ended up fulfilling their purpose. That's what's going on in the real world media. The right is under siege. And I'll be damned if I'm just gonna sit there and let strangers beat me up. What kind of masochist would enjoy that? Now you do uh, explicitly reject the, the alt-right and white nationalism as do the, the Proud Boys and they're warned to stay away from uh, patriot or free speech events that are organised by the alt-right such as the Charlottesville and Charlottesville 2.0. Now to differentiate yourselves you've coined the term alt-light or, or new right. Uh, why, uh, why is this uh, disassociation so important do you feel? Because the West is built on ideas. It's not built on identity politics and talking about race all the time. It's, ta it's about if you come here and you work hard and you have our values, our Judeo-Christian values, you're in. And I would hate it, by the way, if we had a Proud Boys meetup and some black guy who gets vilified by his own family at Thanksgiving, gets disinvited to Christmas for liking Trump, then he finally finds a like-minded group and they go, yo, what's he doing here? That's, that's a nightmare to me. I want someone to have refuge. And so <clears throat> the Proud Boys, like the Western world, say, excuse me, say you work hard and you're in. It's, <laughs> I'm having some phlegm issues here. It's the alt-light, I'm sorry, it's the alt-left and the alt-right, the two far ends of the spectrum that have identity politics, they hate Israel, they're about anti-Semitism, they think everything is about race, they're all atheists, none of them are married and have kids, they're all mentally ill, basically, those two extreme ends of the spectrum. I just want dads back, I want more families, I want us to enjoy ourselves again. You know, you watch an 80s sitcom and you can't believe the kind of jokes they had, they were hilarious. We used to be able to be funny, we used to be able to make jokes with each other. I think. There was a lot more racial harmony in the West when you could make a racist joke to your black friend. Now, people are so scared of offending anyone or getting sued at work or getting fired that they just sit there avoiding each other like the plague. We've created segregation by politically correct uh, policing. Now, one of the slogans of Proud Boys is the West is the best. Uh, now, how are we going 
overall with keeping it that way. I mean, obviously having Trump in the White House is a big uh, asset and he scares the crap out of the, the left, uh, but we still have large scale open immigration to, to Western countries. In Australia, we're getting uh, over 100,000 immigrants uh, per year. Europe, I mean, it's on fire at the moment and yeah. there, there's still political correctness uh, crippling free speech and uh the media and entertainment they're always providing some type of degeneracy <laughs> well the secret to all of this is free and open speech you know you can't deal with a problem if you can't talk about it so i think one of the reasons that we are vilified for going out and having these talks is someone has something to hide I mean, you're not scared of ideas. You can present me with anything. I, I have character. I have honor. I'm honest. So if you want to call me a homosexual, I would go, what? Where'd you get that from? That's not, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that, but that's not true. But they you ever call an alcoholic an alcoholic and watch their just steam come out of their ears. They get so mad because you hit a little too close to home. So these people are petrified of an open and honest discussion because they don't know what they're talking about. And ultimately, I think they know they're wrong. I think they know immigration is a mess. You know, the whole idea of open borders, every country in the world has borders. You know, this whole idea of policing speech, because they're, they're pretending it's they're scared about hate or something or racism, that's a lie. What they're scared of is losing power. And the left is losing power because they don't have the truth on their side. So like all communists and socialists and fascists, actually, they want to stop discussion. And that pisses me off, not just because... I have a lot to say and I don't like being censored, but because that's a bland, Stalinist, gray world. I want a colorful, colorful world. I want Alex Jones to be screaming his head off and banging the table. I want far left and far right to all have a voice. That's an interesting, fun, funny world. But what they're doing with all this censorship is they're taking the color out of our culture. And they pretend to be about multiculturalism and diversity, but they're certainly not for diversity of thought. And that makes for a boring lifestyle. You know, if there's one thing the West is good at, it's fun. And they are taking that away from us. And I am determined to bring back fun because that defines the West like nothing else. Yeah, uh, that's definitely what we need here. More fun, more lightheartedness. Now, it's yeah. been great to uh, obtain this unique insight from you, Gavin. Uh, all of our followers here at The Unshackled are looking forward to your tour and I'll see you when you get here. And you're not going to edit out that fart, are you? I'll, I'll keep it in now, I promise. Great. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great talking to you. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. If you like what you've heard today and want to see Gavin in person, you can grab your tickets, including various VIP passes, by going to gavinlive.com.au. He'll be visiting Melbourne, Perth, Adelaide, the Gold Coast, and Sydney. Also, if you want to keep us going at The Unshackled, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled, or like many of you have been doing recently, send us a direct contribution via our paypal.me slash The Unshackled link, which we are very grateful for. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.